Man. On a cool, crisp evening in the open forest, the stagecoach was moving amongst the shadows of a full silver moon. The moonlight gives the forest magical glow, said Mary Gregory, passenger in the coach. The other passenger was her brother, Magistrate Sir Thomas Gregory. He thought it felt less magical and more eerie and dangerous. He was in highwaymen and footpads in every shadow. He was also very nervous as highwaymen were known to work these woods. Suddenly, a handsome, well-dressed man, carrying a brace of gleaming drilling pistols, appeared. He was riding a white horse and had come out of the shadows into the moonlight. The nervous driver sped up the coach. The horseman was following the coach, but at a faster pace, shouting, Stop or I'll shoot. Stand and deliver your money or your life, shouted the highwayman, firing his pistol. He winged the driver, who, knowing the next shot might kill him, slowed the coach to a stop. The rider caught up with them, and stopping his horse, he dismounted. Mary and her brother climbed out of the coach. Ah, good evening, my lady, and Sir Thomas Gregory. It is a lovely night, is it not? Said the highwayman as he kissed Mary's hand. Oh, yes, it is, responded Mary, enchanted by the moonlight in his gallantry. No, it is not. I would rather have missed this meeting, Faulkner, said the magistrate. Recognising him from wanted posters. Faulkner, not Gentleman John. Faulkner? asked Mary. Guilty, said the highwayman, smiling behind his mask. Your goods, please, Sir Thomas, made Faulkner, pointing a gun at the magistrate. Mary offered up her jewelry. Oh, no, keep your things, my lady said Faulkner, giving her jewellery back. Her brother reluctantly handed over his purse of money. The highwayman turned to the driver. Whose arm was bleeding badly and holding out his hand for more booty. John said, Now you, sir, you should get that arm looked at. It looks quite bad, the 
driver handed over his valuables. The highwayman set them on their way, with Thomas driving and the driver inside the coach, headed by Mary. Nights later, with the weather warming, a new highwayman was on the road for the first time. It seemed to be a youth in a black outfit who was enjoying the thrill of riding through the night. It was the first outing of this new highwayman. This highwayman nearly held up a coach, but he was beaten to it by another highwayman. He saw from a hill where he was waiting for the coach to arrive. So he turned his horse and headed home dejectedly. Next morning, the Gregory home had a visitor. Mary was very excited to meet a famous man she'd never met before. He was an actor who is famous for playing part of the black highwayman on the stage. He was a tall, handsome man. From the moment Mary saw him, she knew she could easily love him. This man's name was Sir Justin Beaufort. Hello, my lady, said the actor. I think you met a real highwayman the other day. I wish I'd been with you. They are so thrilling and romantic. Yes, they are, agreed Mary. No, they are dangerous mercenaries. The driver of the coach died from the wound he got. From the highwayman, or did you forget that? Asked Sir Thomas. Sir Justin looked chastened and nervous. Did he have a family? asked Sir Justin. More than likely. And they'll hang Faulkner now. He has killed someone, said Thomas. He won't hang. It was an accident, said Mary. He shot the man. He should have realised there was a chance the man would die, said Sir Thomas. If they get him, they will hang him. I'm sure of that, said Sir Justin sadly. Later Mary was riding in a coach with Sir Justin, and she heard, Stand and deliver your money or your life. The voice yelled. When the coach stopped, she leapt out of the coach. The driver being murdered. A single shot to the heart. For no other reason than he did not stop quickly enough. She was nervous now. This was the feared killer highwayman, Terence the Terror of Essex. Hand over your loot. Either give it to me now or I'll take it from your body. Terence the Terror said to her. She climbed out quickly, and out of the coach stepped an angry Sir Justin. That's enough, Terry. Give it back, said Sir Justin. He startled the terror, who was confused. Sir Justin walked over, disarmed him, and pointed the terror's own gun at him. I said give it back, Terry, said Sir Justin. Don't call him Terry. People say he doesn't like that. This isn't the theatre. He'll kill you, said Mary nervously. He'll have to wait in line, said Sir Justin. With a smile. Sir Justin, you are annoying me. Nobody robs me, not even my friends. You will pay. 
for this. Stand down and I will forget it, said the terror. Stand and deliver, Terry, said Sir Justin. He is drunk. Ignore him, Mr. Terror, said Mary. He's stone cold, sober and stubborn, said the highwayman. Terence the Terror handed back the loot, but he was fuming. Sir Justin shot in the air to disarm the gun. You are my friend, have your property, and let us go on our way, said Sir Justin. You are not my friend, said Terence the Terror, hopping over to his horse. You know something? I think I've lost a friend, said Sir Justin sadly, as he drove the coach off. You are insane, shouted back Mary from inside the coach. Later in the day, at the Gregory home, Tom, your friend is a nut, said Mary, when they arrived with the body of the driver. What did you do, murder the driver so he could drive the coach? asked Thomas. She just laughed. No, that was Terence the Terror, said Sir Justin. Oh, did he kill the driver so he could drive it? said Thomas. Are you insane? asked Sir Justin. No, said Sir Thomas. Terence the Terror held us up. He shot the driver. Then I held up the Terror, said Sir Justin. You did what? asked Sir Thomas. I bailed up the Terror. I took your sister's stuff back. And she was under my care, said Sir Justin. Thank you. Did you take him in? asked Thomas. No, I let him go, said Sir Justin. Why would you do that? asked Sir Thomas. Someone had to drive the coach. And I could not be sure of Mary's safety. I kept him. Replied Sir Justin. You know he'll try to kill you, said Sir Thomas. If he does, he does. I could never live with myself if he robbed someone under my care, replied Sir Justin. That night, the youthful highwayman rode again. This time he stopped the coach and started to rob people when three highwaymen arrived on the scene. You do this, are you, lad? Said one of them. The youth panicked and fell off the horse, banging his head hard, and was knocked out by the fall. Terry, I think you killed him, said one of the others. He was a black head. Highwayman named the ghost for his sudden appearances and disappearances. Yes, the boy is knocked out. Not dead, said Gentleman John, who was riding with him. Terry just scared him, said John. We can't leave him here. What will we do? said the highwayman the ghost. A Robin Hood type highwayman. They completed the robbery. John picked up the body and hung it over his horse. The ghost took the horse of the young highwayman and they rode off to Gentleman John's house. I'll look after him till he comes round. Offered John. The old band of pyromen sat drinking and chatting for a few hours. Then the terror and the ghost left. When they had gone, 
John made a strange discovery. The boy had long hair. He had a bun. And his hat had been pinned to it. He found this out. He tried to remove the hat so he could put the lad to rest on his bed. He put her on the bed and sat looking at a script for a new play. And he sat drinking for a while. Later, when the highway woman woke up, it was like a play of a ham actor. Where am I? she muttered. Putting down the script. He walked over to her. How do you feel, miss? Asked John. Miss? Said the highwayman, not sure how he knew what she was or where she was. She felt for her mask. It was there. I saw your hair. If I knew you were a woman, my friends would have stayed, said John. Why? For your honour, said John. Who has said there is no honour among thieves? Oh yes, said the highway woman. Nothing happened, but I'll marry you to keep your honour, said John. The highway woman stood up, still a bit wonky. She thought she was dreaming. Was a man of honor and she loved him so she was happy she started to take off her mask and he stopped her no don't it's not safe seeing each other's faces they cause us problems all right then she said and stopped trying to unmask in the early morning, she said goodbye and left for home. A few hours later, Mary was sitting in the forest near her home, enjoying the new autumn day. So Justin saw her on his way to visit her brother. He got off his horse and tied it to a branch of a small tree and walked over to her. What are you doing, my lady? Asked Sir Justin. Thinking she looked very pretty amongst the autumn leaves. She blushed. It is a funeral here today. Said Mary. Looking at Justin, who looked more handsome than ever. It's a glorious day. Said to Justin, not lying. Are you all right? Yes, come sit beside me, said Mary. Why? asked Sir Justin. The view is best from here, said Mary. As long as no one's around, said Sir Justin. With a smile, he said, No one is here. Justin sat beside her. What are we looking at? asked Sir Justin. Everything. The wind is singing, and the forest floor is covered in crisp leaves, thick as snow, said Mary, forgetting propriety and everything. He lay back on his back in the leaves. I have never seen anything so beautiful. I could forget everything and live here in this moment forever. And looking up at the sky, he said, This looks better. Mary lay back too and watched the leaves fall from the trees, blowing in the wind. The leaf fell down floating onto her heart. She put her hand on it. The voice interrupted the scene. 
Oh, there you are, Mary. Have you been with him all night? Everyone has been looking for you, accused Sir Thomas. No, Sir Justin said, standing. I just found her here. I was on my way to see you. Mary, trying to stand, fell over her long skirt. I was not with him, said Mary. Sir Justin thought he could see a forced marriage wedding being set up. I can't marry her, said Sir Justin. Why? asked Sir Thomas. I can't say, said Sir Justin. No excuses means you must marry her for your honour and hers, said Sir Thomas. Don't you use my honour against me, said Sir Justin. You must marry her as you were driven by your honour. Sir Thomas said. Sir Justin shook his head, jumped on his horse, and rode away. Later that day, Sir Justin sat with his friend, the Earl of Essex, the cousin of Gentleman Jack, in their friend, the King's Library, chatting. How was your day, Sir Justin? asked the king. Great, I'm engaged, said Sir Justin. Congratulations, replied the earl, with a strong French accent. Who is she? asked the king. A sister or a friend of mine, said Sir Justin. Who is your friend? asked the earl. A magistrate from Loughton, said Sir Justin, not your friend Sir Thomas Gregory, asked the Earl. Yes, his sister, said Sir Justin, taking a sip of wine. His sister is lovely. She'll make a good wife for you, the Earl said. She thinks I'm a madman, Justin said, taking another sip. Why on earth would she think that? Asked the king. I bail up the terror, said Sir Justin, drawing a big sip of wine. You did what? Asked the earl excitedly. Why on earth would you do that? Asked the king. She was under my care, and the terror held us up. I was protecting her said Sir Justin. So you robbed him? said the Earl. You're lucky to be alive. The terror is a killer, said the King. I know, he killed the driver, said Sir Justin. He'll try kill you for that, said the King. He'll be doing me a service, said Sir Justin. Are you all right? asked the Earl. I don't want to marry that girl, Sir Justin said. Later Sir Justin went to the Earl's blacksmith, David Buckingham, shop, to get his horse reshod. Your horse is calm today, said David. I fed her before we came. He calms her down, said Sir Justin. A soldier walked into the smithy. Where's my gun? demanded the soldier. I'm busy. Please come back later, sir, said David. No, I want it now, snapped the soldier impatiently. Patience is a virtue, said the smith. I have no time for words, said the soldier, kicking the smith which saddled the horse, which kicked the smith in the guts. My gun, now, man, said the impatient soldier, not caring that the man was hurt. Stand away, man. 
said Sir Justin, pulling out his gun. Are you all right? I feel like I was kicked by a horse, Jack, said the ghost. The soldier looked puzzled. Gentleman Jack glared at the soldier. The ghost got the man's gun and gave it to him. I fixed it. Now pay the fee we agreed to and be on your way, the ghost said. The soldier paid him and left. We need to get you to a doctor, said Jack, helping his friend onto David's horse and jumped onto and rode David the ghost to his doctor. Later, Jack dropped the ghost off in town where he did what any man who'd been kicked by a horse would do. He went to the pub and drank a little too much. When he was drinking, he heard a soldier talking about an old friend of his from the wars who was still a soldier being set before a firing squad for a crime of another soldier. Do you want a blindfold? asked the captain of the regiment. No, Malcolm Giles. The man being shot called back. Ready, aim. Fight! was all the captain called. He saw three highwaymen aiming at him. Shoot and your captain's dead, shouted Jack. Faulkner, tell your friends to stand down. This man is to get his just... Just... Shouted the captain. Terence Norton, a.k.a. the Terror. No, he was framed. The ghost shouted back. No, he was not, shouted Terry. Release him, ordered Jack. Do as he says, barked Terry, not wanting to be shot. Silver buckles, take the man his horse, said the ghost to the highway woman. She did as she was told. They had brought a spare horse for Malcolm. He leapt onto it and they rode off in a hail of bullets. Sir Thomas, a soldier is here to see you, said the housekeeper of the Gregory house to her master. Show him into the library. I'll talk to him there, said Sir Thomas. A little time later, in the Gregory Library, the soldier was shown in. It was Captain Terence Norton. What is your name, Captain? asked Sir Thomas. I would rather not say. I am here to help you catch a highwayman. Said Terry. Why? asked Sir Thomas. I would rather not say, said Terry. I hear you want to catch the highwayman John Faulkner, said Terry. Yes, said Sir Thomas. Over the following weeks, the highwayman and highwaywoman became inseparable and took to the roads most nights. They planned to run away and marry after one last job. It all went wrong. There was an unexpected ambush. They were on their horses when they demanded the passengers disembark from the coach. They didn't notice the gun pointing from the coach until it was too late. But when they did, they rode away. It was Sir Thomas who shot one of them. John could have escaped. But he jumped off his running horse, which continued on its way. 
He ran back to his fiance, the highway woman. You shot her, said John accusingly, kneeling down, cradling her, looking into her face. Why didn't you escape? asked the dying highway woman. I don't want to live without you, said John. I have the two of them. I shall unmask them, said Sir Thomas, unmasking John. His eyes widened and looked horrified. Hi, said Sir Justin. But you are engaged to my sister, who is the harlot, asked Sir Thomas, ripping off her mask, looking devastated. Mary, no, cried Sir Thomas. Mary, my other fiancé, said John. I love, said Mary, and died. John kissed her for the first and last time. The Earl of Essex and someone called Captain Norton from Loughton are here to see John Faulkner, said a guard to the prison administrator. Essex is his cousin. Okay. Let him go in, said the administrator. They were taken in to Jack's cell and left alone to talk to him. I'm sorry, Jack, about what happened. I didn't want anyone to die, said Terry. We're here to break you out, said the Earl. You can't do that. You'd be revealing yourselves as the terror and the ghost, right? said Jack. We don't care anymore, said Terry. We only want to see you free, said the Earl, who was the ghost. I don't want to live without Mary, said Jack. Thanks, but I just want to be with Mary in the hereafter. Goodbye, Jack. We'll miss you said the ghost I'll miss you holding me up Goat the tower goodbye he said she was worth holding up a friend over and I hope you and she will find happiness in the next life I'll see your body is buried near your Mary said the earl Hugging his cousin one last time. Thank you, said Jack. Goodbye until we meet again in the hereafter. With that, the ghost and the terror left Jack to his fate in his cell. A few weeks later, John joined her in death. As John was standing on the gallows at Tyburn, Sir Thomas Watch the noose go round John's neck. Sir Thomas was sad. He knew he'd miss John and Justin. The executioner reached for the pull lever for the trap door. Then the magistrate closed his eyes. He saw Mary and John lying in the leaves in the forest and he heard John saying, never seen anything so beautiful I could forget everything and live here in this moment forever I have never seen anything so beautiful I could forget In the
this land of mystery where he finds his